Hi, my name is Owen O'Malley. I'm from the School of Law and Government at Dublin City University. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about making policy and how politicians make policy work. Uh, politics is about trying to solve problems and public policies then are politicians attempt to solve those problems. The policies try to achieve an end which wouldn't exist without those policies, so they try to change things. Now, what are those problems? Well, there are private problems, problems that people can and possibly should solve for themselves. And there are public problems, ones that require state intervention. Distinguishing between the two is not always as clear. Uh, and a lot of the divisions that we see in day-to-day -day politics center on whether problems are private or public. An example might help illustrate the issue between of the two. Say I'm overweight and we might think that a private problem that I need to solve myself by changing my diet, taking more exercise. However, if we find that significant cohorts within society have weight issues, it might be for reasons that the individuals themselves cannot address. For instance, there may be limited facilities to take exercise. Our food sold may be very high in fat or sugar content. I can't build a public park or a gym for me to exercise in nor am I likely to be successful in lobbying a food company to reduce the sugar content in their foods, assuming I even know that there is a high sugar content. These public problems are often called collective action problems. That is problems in which one person's behavior on his or her own won't solve that for the person. Or that person cannot avoid being negatively impacted by other people's behavior. We need collective action where everybody acts collectively in order to solve the problem. So an example might be climate change, where you individually making an attempt to reduce your waste or emissions is unlikely to have an impact on the overall problem. It will require all of our collective actions to do that. But you may not have any incentive to reduce your emissions. If everyone else is reducing theirs, your emissions won't make much of a difference. And so you could probably get the benefits of emission reduction without having to pay the costs of having to reduce yours. If no one else is reducing theirs, then why would you bother paying the costs if you won't yield any benefits? So collective action problems then tend to be solved by the state because it'll be very difficult for us individually, voluntarily to agree to change our behavior. Gender equality may be an example of a collective action problem in that we may all be made better off if men and women shared their roles in society more equally. For instance, we know policymaking is more effective where men, women, people from working class backgrounds, middle class backgrounds, and all different types of backgrounds contribute to the debate. But it may not be in my individual interest for women to be promoted above me, so I might resist this. If I do, there are what social scientists call negative externalities to my behavior. So if I engage in gender discrimination, it may not make me worse off, but collectively it makes us all worse off if, for instance, we don't hire the best teachers, the best civil servants, the best doctors, whatever. So the state might require collective action in which it forces us to behave in certain ways. Policymakers rely on a number of instruments to solve uh, collective action problems. These can be summarized as regulation, incentives, information, and provision. Now, each of these on their own probably won't solve things. And we tend to see that policies to be effective require a team. You require a lot of policy instruments at work in order to solve a, a difficult problem. So what do we mean by each of these instruments? Let's go through them. Regulation is about setting rules. Uh, we set standards for how people, organizations, or businesses behave in what the state sees as the public interest. For instance, we now regulate that employers must not make hiring decisions on the basis of the sex of the applicant. We require that some organizations maintain data on different characteristics of applicants or employees, and courts can force employers to provide compensation or redress if, if there's evidence of discrimination. Incentives provide a motivation, often a financial motivation to get people, organizations, businesses to behave in the public interest. 
So in Ireland, we require political parties to have a minimum number of candidates of either sex. Uh, otherwise, party funding is severely, severely curtailed. The state also uses the policy instrument of issuing information. It gives advice or guidance on how to behave. We see posters uh, calling on people to report cases of gender-based uh, violence or abuse. Websites exist to inform people of their rights if they are in an abusive relationship. The fourth type of instrument uh, is provision. The state directly provides goods that the state will think help might solve a problem. So in some countries, the state directly provides early childcare. And in most countries, education is provided for free. In order to decide what policies the state or government should choose, it often engages in what are called cost benefit analyses, in which policy specialists try to weigh up the strengths and weaknesses of alternative policies in an attempt to see what the best option is. The government is likely to engage in a cost benefit analysis when evaluating your recommendations. So we might consider whether the state should provide childcare for free or should people pay for it? What are the likely costs of providing the childcare? What are the benefits of providing it for free? In this case, the costs are probably well known. The costs include the actual financial cost of providing childcare, but also the costs of to people who used to provide it privately. There may also be costs though, if children don't spend as much time with their parents. The benefits might be more diffuse. Uh, there are benefits to parents. Free childcare relieves them of a significant cost and may allow them to uh, work in jobs that would not have otherwise covered the cost of childcare. But there may be wider benefits to society if children are socialized into appropriate behavior at an early age. The government then looks at the returns in comparison to the costs. Some of these are easy to measure, with others, it's much more difficult to assign a euro value to them. Even if assigning costs and benefits were easy, it gets much more difficult. There are trade-offs everywhere. Uh, the state can't provide everything for everyone, and so there's no magic money tree. If it provides goods to the public, they need to be paid for. They may be paid for by increasing taxes, or they could be uh, paid for by cutting back services in other areas. Increasing taxes is really popular, as those who pay the bulk of taxes might wonder why they're paying for something whose benefits don't accrue to them directly. We can see then that there is a need for a government to mediate different, often conflicting interests within a society. If the state is paying for parents to, uh, to have their children looked after, why are non-parents being asked to subsidize this? Those trade-offs aren't easy and mediating the conflicts within society are the bread and butter of day-to-day -day politics. When there are conflicting interests within society, those conflicting interests can often be based on alternative time horizons. So we can see that some policies might be designed to deliver an immediate positive impact, whereas others might prioritize longer term outcomes. For instance, climate change policies might be a bequest to our great great grandchildren but they might impose unemployment or reduce economic growth on the current uh, generation. And so by solving one problem, we may create another. These again are the problems that politicians have to grapple with and making decisions is really easy because in the real world, outcomes aren't going to be that clear. There will also often be unintended consequences to our policy choices. Think about a Rubik's cube. You think you're moving one block into position, but in so doing, you actually displace a lot of others. And well-intentioned policies may incentivize outcomes that run counter to the initial objective. For instance, increasing maternity benefits designed to help women and mothers may have made it less likely that businesses employ women. They may simply have imposed unbearable costs on those businesses, making it less likely that they will employ them. Policies are about trying to change the way the world is. But the world is incredibly complex. They rarely make for easy political choices. And so beware of those who say that there are easy answers. 